thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. Uh, you know, we're very happy. Uh, we have a very a nice sizable crowd already. Uh, we know how busy and stressed out everyone is these days. So we, we really appreciate your time and effort at being here. Uh, I, I'm uh, Dr. Gail Fromer. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of the United States uh, in partnership with the Fulbright Program at Tel Aviv University. Uh, this event is a joint effort with uh, our good friends at the Francis Brody Institute for Applied Diplomacy uh, in the Department of Social Sciences at Tel Aviv University. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank Professor Yossi Schein and Dr. Evgeny Klauber for this wonderful uh, collaboration, as well as, as Ora Scherer and uh, Adar Dronman from our center staff. Uh, and also a special thanks as always to our good friends and partners at the United States Embassy in Israel and the Fulbright program here who really make these public events possible. So, so I, I really, uh, I wanna thank you guys and I wanna thank the audience and certainly I wanna thank uh, the, the wonderful speakers that we have been able to gather here uh, tonight for you. All right, so obviously these are trying times, I think uh, terrifying times, depressing times even for, for anyone who cares and thinks about the United States uh, and tonight we'll try to analyze and speculate what the incoming president-elect Joe Biden's foreign policy might look like, especially in the Middle East, uh, and, and what might be its regional and local implications. Uh, to say that Biden has his work cut out for him, I think would be a gross understatement. Uh, 75 years exactly, I think since founding what Henry Luce famously labeled the American century at the end of World War II, I think America's position in the world appears as tenuous as ever. And, and looking forward at how Biden might approach and resolve this, I think is, is what we're gonna try to do tonight from a variety of angles. Uh, just three things I think we do need to just uh, keep in mind engaging in this conversation. Uh, first, I think there's no going back to 2016, right? Anyone who thinks Obama, uh, excuse me, that's Freudian slip, right? Anyone who thinks Biden's foreign policy will be in Obama uh, 2.0, I think is, is th that's not gonna happen. I think too much has changed in the global balance of power in the last four years. You know, the remarkable strengthening of, of China, the impact of COVID, the trade wars, the, the severe weakening of American alliances and partnerships around the world. Uh, and, and even everything that's happened in the Middle East, the Abrahamic Accords, right? The decision by Iran a few weeks ago to to uh, uh, enrich uranium again, up, up to 20%, right? Something that, that has not been done. Uh, so in that sense, I think, you know, as Lady Macbeth said, what's done cannot be undone. So I don't think we're gonna go back to where we were on the eve of the Trump presidency, right? Too much has changed. So that, that's one thing I think we need to take for granted. The second thing is, is just COVID. COVID changed the nature of international relations, I think profoundly in a way that has, has reprioritize geopolitical, military, and economic strength, right? And has kind of elevated environmental and, and health, especially public health concerns to, to prominent levels uh, that I'm not sure the United States along these new lines of environmental, medical, health, uh, uh, security is as strong and as able to compete with, with other global powers as it obviously is in the military and geopolitical strength. Uh, and final thing I wanna say, uh, and I, I think we must address this in one way or another is, is, is everything that happened on Wednesday, right? Uh, I think obviously these are the culmination of, of broader forces and the erosion of American democracy that we've seen, not, not just in the last four years, but really in the last few decades. Uh, and, and therefore I think America's most important strategic asset that had allowed it in the last 75 years to create the, the Ameri right, the kind of the American century. And, and it was its image, its image as the model of democracy from whence it drew its moral legitimacy. I think that has become severely strained, compromised, undermined. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't think we can even use these terms of American exceptionalism or thinking about America or, or the president of the US as the leader of the free world, the same way we used to do it with that same confidence in America that we had or, or, or at least I have, right, in the last uh, few decades or maybe even throughout the Cold War. So, so in that sense, uh, you know, when, when I, I think Biden's biggest foreign policy challenge is actually going to be domestic. It's rooted in trying to rebuild the confidence in that, that tarnished image of America. And I just, you know, when I think back to everything that's happened in the last week, I, 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 I was recalling George Kennan, the great American diplomat, you know, and the way he ends the, the long telegram of you know, that one very important uh, 
telegram that he writes about Soviet policy at, at the onset of the Cold War. And he says, the last line of the telegram, and I'm paraphrasing, he says something uh, along the line of, of, you know, the greatest danger that can befall on us is that we allow ourselves to become like those with whom we are coping, that we become like our enemies. And, and in that sense, I think one of the greatest challenges that, that the Biden doctrine faces is overcoming that. Okay, so that's by way of a very short introduction. And now I, I, I'm very happy to, uh, to uh, invite the, the guests to our round table, our virtual round table discussion. Just some basic ground rules here. Uh, all the questions, please, through the chat. All right, so it's either through the chat or through our email at the center, and then that, that'll filter to me and I will, I'll be able to, you know, I'll bunch some of these questions together and then I'll ask it to our, to our esteemed panel. All right, so no, no, the microphones are shut off and everything has to be through the chat or through the email of the center, which is now gonna be written on the chat. Uh, okay, so uh, that's it for the ground rules and, and just enjoy yourselves and I hope, and I'm sure this will be a stimulating conversation. So uh, it's my great pleasure to invite uh, our, our first speaker, who's, who's my good friend and colleague, Professor Yossi Schein. Uh, Yossi just concluded a, a very successful term as the head of, uh, of the School of Government at Tel Aviv University, and he is the head of the Francis Brody Institute for Applied Diplomacy. Uh, and he will be talking about the man who has seen it all, what Joe Biden's past experiences can teach us about his foreign policy. Uh, Yossi, please. Uh, thank you so much, Yoav. And, uh... I see so many faces here that I know. It's a pleasure being here. Many of you are very much familiar with the American scene, familiar with American foreign policy. I'm sure all of you can make comments. We are trying now at this stage to speculate a bit to see whether we can um, somewhat uh, make sense of American foreign policy into the future uh, because of uh, the current events and also because of the legacy of Joe Biden. I'm not sure these are all um, gonna teach us much at this stage, but certainly gives us some directions as we uh, envision what will happen next. And certainly, as we all know, we are all, many of us here I see on the screen are scholars of political science and scholars of international relations. We know that oftentimes uh, the events themselves throw themselves to us and presidents and foreign policy makers are sometimes faced with challenges that they have not seen before or did not uh, plan to deal with. But nevertheless, this is an, an interesting exercise uh, just a week before President Biden taking office. I will say uh, two things at the outset of my remarks. Uh, the last, last week events in many ways, uh, of course, as you have pointed out, are traumatizing events which uh, uh, I would say uh, debunk the essence of the American exceptionalism or the American democracy in the minds and hearts of some. And nevertheless, uh, maybe giving us some new opportunities because uh, Mr. Biden, President Biden will start his tenure as president with I would say a much better sense of unity that he would have been otherwise doing if the exit or the, 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 uh, the, the, the terrible exit of Trump from the scene would have not taken place. In other words, what happened to Trump or what happened to America in the last week may strengthen uh, Biden because everybody understands that we need to see a stronger America, a more unified America, an America that perhaps speaking was a more coherent voice, not only domestically, but also internationally. People understand the challenge, to what extent they will follow through with, uh, I would say, civility and will, will, will back the president's policies and will give him uh, the, uh, not only uh, the benefit of the doubt, but basically will support him understanding that they have to build a new persona. American is a new persona in international affairs. This is a very interesting case because we know politics tends also to uh, quickly run into uh, its uh, illnesses and the, the, the bipartisanship and the, the, the gridlock, all of those things that are happening on the Hill. But in this case, I think we have a chance of trying to see that the, uh, the forces on the Hill and the forces on, in Washington themselves are more uh, uh, supportive of Trump. Uh, of Trump, I said, of Mr. Biden. Um, last night, I had a long talk with a good friend of mine, 
I will not name his name, but some of you know that played a very important role in American foreign policy. And we talked at length about, I, I told him about our conference today, and um, he, uh, he, he expressed some concerns about the um, ability of Americans to, to, to really understand that there is a continuation in foreign policy. The very essence of the state, the realist approach, that the state have interest, and we have to follow through. And what has been done by one administration should not be immediately erased by the next one. Maybe, of course, is the sense of normality that American foreign policy uh, should have once again. Notwithstanding, of course, differences of, of ideologies, differences of temperaments, and differences of opinions about certain places in the world, as we know that the Biden administration will have vis-a-vis -vis the Trump administration. But the very question was, in the mind of this gentleman was, to what extent the very essence or the delegitimation that took place in the last week of Trump and his entire administration and legacy will also blemish the foreign policy effort made by the, form, the former administration. To what extent they will be able to carry some of the policies which had, you know, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, especially on human rights, et cetera, et cetera, issues, that, or of course on the Middle East that we will hear a lot today, will continue, or whether there will be a question of basically debunking everything that Trump did and moving into uh, a, a, new, a new idea. And I think here we will see what people are calling into the, the question, the big question of the Trump administration. Uh, again, I said Trump many times, I'll say I mean Biden administration. It's something that we'll have to get used to. The Biden administration, people are talking in three levels. One is what they call restoration, the other is reformation, and yet the other is revolution. These are the three issues that people are talking about, that people are writing about. These are not my terms, but they're constantly coming to the fore in the writings of people about what will happen in the Biden administration. To what extent they will restore the so-called Obama they will kind of like reform what has been happening in the Trump administration, or will move forward into a complete revolution and overall of the Obama of the of the Trump administration. One has to remember at this point that the foreign policy of Trump, or at least the rhetoric of the foreign policy of Trump, was very hostile to the foreign policy of the Obama administration. It was as if everything was nullified is if the Trump administration, which came to the White House, the, the, if someone was looking for a strategy of the Trump administration, was the idea that everything you did, I will do it differently, almost like the song. The very idea that everything you did, I will do it differently. The big question will be here again, will be this mentalité will again take place in the White House. I don't think so. And I don't think so based on what you have said to begin with, the big challenge that Biden has as a unifier, both domestically, but also as someone who does not want to rock the boat because the boat has been rocked too much. And the question is how to maintain a certain semblance of stability, a semblance of, I would say, credibility, integrity, gradually bringing the United States into a new position both domestically and internationally in terms of a respected power that will basically shine once again and the shining city on the hill will reverberate once again in a different, in a different manner. This will require an assemblance of administration as we see the administration being assembled right now that will have to act in moderation. Moderation will be let's treat the acute issues, let's treat certain issues perhaps with, ven with, I would say, with, with great new energy, but not always by debunking the former president or by moving into something completely new in a revolutionary manner. And here we have to deal with certain issues which I just want to highlight. And of course, we cannot discuss all of them. One of course of the issues that will be discussed among the Biden administration and will try to make a quick shift, I would say, is what we call the transatlantic uh, alliance. We want to see a new relations between America and Europe. Here the discussion already began. We saw the discussion be began already in November, in December, how to rejuvenate the alliance, the alliance which suffered 
uh, quite dramatically under President Trump in terms of the uh, 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 the good the, 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 the ties of with NATO, which is a very important feature of this alliance, but not only in terms of the ties with NATO, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the Russian uh, question, vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, on issues of trades, etc. This will be relations that everybody is waiting in Europe for a much more cordial relation, relations that will bring kind of like a more friendship, understanding that this friendship is a different, it, it, the language will be different. And I think when we talk about the transatlantic alliance, uh, the Trump administration uh, will see again that there will be um, an emphasis that this alliance between us and the Europeans is an alliance that cannot be broken, especially vis-a-vis -vis vis -vis vis -vis Russia. This will be a language that the French are waiting for. It has been somewhat impeded, of course, by the foreign policy that was vis-a-vis uh, -vis because of the European Union. One has to remember that Trump was a, a major supporter of Brexit and not of, uni of European unity. And this, of course, will also impact to what extent Europe can start to speak in a, in a, in a, in a one voice or sort in a different fashion and with greater power. I think the Biden administration, in my opinion, will spend lots of effort to bring this issue to the fore and to strengthen the alliance, both security-wise and, of course, in terms of trade and values, etc., vis-a-vis Europe. This is also, of course, in relation to Russia. Here we will see what will be the position, uh, to what extent there will be, a, you know, Biden himself was much more aggressive vis-a-vis -vis Russia in the, uh, the uh, Obama administration than Obama was. And here we'll see what kind of standing Biden will take. The second issue, of course, and which will be immediate, will be on the issue of climate. The issue of climate is much more than just the issue of climate, is a symbolic issue for sort of the liberal creed, so to speak. And I think here the shift will be much faster on the issue of the Paris Accord. The Biden administration will join again, will celebrate the issue. He also appointed, appointed Kerry as the, as the secretary. This will be an issue that can be, I would say, uh, a consensus issue. It's one of those issues that I would say it's an easy issue. It's a long-term issue. It's a very important issue in foreign affairs, but it's an issue that will not create a divide ideologically in terms of the spirit that Biden will try to create vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis European and also will bring back forces that are uh, more of the liberal creed and forces even in the progressive creed. He will be able perhaps to temper criticism by the progressive by using the climate as an issue. Giving more essence to the climate issue is by basically uh, shutting, I mean, some of the criticism that will come from the more progressive wings in the Democratic Party that will want a more revolutionary approach on other matters. So the climate issue, I think, will be a key factor that will change uh, by the, uh, by the uh, uh, Biden administration. Mm -hmm. A third issue that will be a very critical issue, or the fourth issue, is, of course, the issue of China. Here again, there should be an important factor. We uh, all read, and I don't know if we all read, but we certainly, some of you have seen the, the long work that was done by the, uh, by the uh, uh, Trump team uh, and the foreign policy team um, on the issue of China. This was a long paper, a long and important paper about the position of China in international affairs. Um, with the Trump administration, we had kind of like uh, the, the, the trade war and we had the lovey-dovey relations in the beginning and then retreat. It was not clear in the beginning how it will work. With the Biden administration, I think we should see how the Biden administration approach the China challenge, which is the most acute challenge in the United States right now. It's not just the decline of democracy, as you said, you have on the issue. China is posing the greatest challenge, not only to the United States on the international scene, but China is really challenging the very ethos of democracy in a different fashion. And this was proven again, once again, during the coronavirus crisis, China with its authoritarian nature, with its uh, 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 claims, both in, 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 in Hong Kong and Taiwan, all over the world, the Chinese case is a very critical case for the United States to deal with as the case for the future. 
how we really want to approach China. Do we want really to fight on the issue of values? How much we are going to really position ourselves again vis-a-vis -vis China as if we are again, yet again, in a certain Cold War. The paper of the, uh, of the Foreign Policy uh, Institute or the, uh, foreign, the, plan, the Foreign Policy Planning of the State Department under uh, Secretary Pompeo was very adamant in the, in the nature of these relations, claiming that we really have to change aggressively our posture vis-a-vis -vis China with a certain emphasis, which I thought was overemphasizing the issue of ideology, that the Communist Party's ideology is still so dominant. I don't think that this is the key. It's not the key of the communist ideology that we have to fight as if we were in the Cold War era, but it's certainly the legacy of authoritarianism. And the legacy of authoritarianism is the key here to what extent the Biden administration will want to be the champion again of what I call marketing the American creed abroad, sort of like the democratic creed. It's clear that the Obama administration was more reluctant to do so, was less interested or perhaps uh, uh, in, 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 in speaking about the liberal values, but rather asking more that we will live together in a civilizational manner, that we will somehow co-opt in a civilizational manner. Here, I think the language of democracy may come back to the fore as a, as a language of sort of like the Wilsonian values of the United States foreign policy will come back in a much, uh, uh, or potentially can come back in a much, uh, 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 um, I would say heightened fashion, because this issue is a key issue to deal with China, not only on the global trade issues, but also on the legacy of world order, on the legacy of human rights, on the legacy of the nature of the international system. Here it will be a big issue to see to what extent the European are joining in this, uh, who are the allies, who is, how do we assemble the allies, to what extent the United States will be able to collaborate on this matter with the Japanese, with the Indians perhaps in a different fashion. So here we have huge challenges that needs to be addressed because the prism of China will give us the issue to what extent democracy will be in retreat as people are talking about it, as the economy, the 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 uh, the, uh, the economists decline, the, the cried uh, once again, the the uh, the uh, democracy is in, in decline, or whether democracy will come back to the fore as the single most important factor in understanding global world order. Uh, my time is up. Are you making? Uh, yeah. Okay. I will make one more point, and I will stop here. My in just introductory comments. Uh, of course, we live in the Middle East. And we have lots of interest in what is happening here. No doubt that the shifts in the Middle East that were made by, with the support of the Trump administration have advanced us in a tremendous fashion. And what happened in the Middle East, and we know about Biden, I didn't speak much about Biden, the person as you wanted me to, but if you read Dennis Ross's book, and I have the Dennis Ross's book here, uh, just um, the last one, doomed to succeed that you know, but Dennis Ross's book, sort of like how Biden saw the Middle East conflict. The, the, the prism through which the Obama administration looked at the Middle East was of course the Palestinian prism. We're gonna, I get, Brendan will talk about whoever, everybody will talk about. Here, of course, we changed the language in the Middle East. We came back to the language of power, the language of interest, and we made tremendous advancements vis-a-vis -vis the Arab countries, vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim world, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that the uh, Biden administration would like to retrieve from that. I don't think that the Biden administration will adopt immediately the, the, uh, the uh, Trump plan for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but nevertheless, they will do very well, and I'm not advising them, if they will not just like remove it from the agenda and come back to the old agenda. There is, of course, the Iranian case you mentioned already, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about it, that they want to go to get with the Iranians in a different, in a, in a, in a different negotiate, negotiating uh, 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 deal. But I think that on the issue of the Middle East peace, on the issue of arranging the Middle East, the Biden administration may take a very slow, very slow steps. They will not try to revolutionize it once again and emphasize the issue of, 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 of the Palestinian rights or Palestinian state. I think, of course, I believe it's going to be a big mistake, but I think this is also uh, 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 the inclination right now, as I see it at least in the discussion uh, by the foreign policy uh, 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 
uh, by the foretelling papers that I see or the writings or the pronouncement made by administra for, for, um, former administration, uh, for, former members of the Obama administration and future uh, members of the Biden administration. So let me just wrap it up and I will say that between the three, the reformation, the restoration and the revolution, I think that we will be more kind of the moderate, the moderate approach, at least initially, the moderate approach where was emphasis on issue and putting American back on the world stage as a different superpower. A superpower was a face not only a real politique and aggressive in a certain fashion or the rhetoric of Trump, but something that also shines in terms of values. How much it will be done? What will be the tenor? How much it will be sort of like a, a, a need to, to be exploded very quickly or not? All of this needs to be tested uh, on the ground, and, uh, and 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 we we are yet to be yet to examine that into the future. But I my sus my suspicion is that Trump uh, that Biden again that Biden coming into office is trying to create a new persona for the United States domestically and internationally, something that will be kind of like creating a different perception of what America is all about and will try gradually to move into the international scene as the, as, as the superpower that one has to look up to, not only in terms of power, but only in terms of, I would say, vision, uh, 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 inspiration, et cetera, et cetera, a democratic kind of creed. So thank you for, um, this is very quickly kind of like, as you gave me some introductory remarks, these are my introductory remarks. All right, so, so thank you very much, Yossi, right? And I think moving from the contemporary and the analysis of what is happening now and what is going to happen, I think uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Benny Miller to give us a, a historical and a theoretical, I think, analysis of what the, the Biden doctrine uh, might and will look like. Uh, uh, Benny is from the University of Haifa, uh, and it, it's worth mentioning he just, he just published a wonderful book in the, in the United States, right? Uh, it's, it's called Grand Strategy from Truman to Trump. I, I had the, the privilege to read it over the weekend. And it, it's a reappraisal of, of the origins and the theoretical strategy model of the United States. Uh, and we are very happy to host him. Uh, and so please, uh, Benny, the Biden doctrine, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, you all very much for the kind invitation. And uh, it's really a great honor and a delight uh, to be here uh, uh, this evening. Uh, what I would like uh, uh, to do in my presentation is actually uh, to look at the uh, uh, Biden's grand strategy in a comparative perspective, but in two comparisons. One is to look at the big changes that the US grand strategy has done since the end of World War II uh, until, uh, until uh, today. And secondly, actually to compare what I call Biden two to Biden one. And that will reflect a lot of the changes that might take place in American uh, grand strategy. What I mean by Biden one is really part of the liberal elite, which actually included both Democrats and Republicans that dominated uh, uh, American grand strategy after the end of the Cold War and pursued a, a, a liberal a grand strategy. And uh, Biden both as the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as well as later as the vice president of President Obama, was one of the leading forces of this uh, liberal hegemony, liberal uh, grand strategy. But what I will argue now that uh, the new Biden, Biden too, Biden the incoming uh, president, uh, will conduct a different policy than Biden won. Uh, and actually there will be some similarities with Trump. They will be completely different in the rhetoric, in the style, but actually while there will be major differences from um, uh, the earlier Biden uh, um, strategy and views about foreign policy, there will be some continuation with Trump despite all the major differences uh, between uh, uh, Trump and uh, and by them. Okay, um, the, uh, this uh, PowerPoint, uh, this uh, part of the PowerPoint kind of reflects the major changes very briefly that took place in American grand strategy. Obviously, it's kind of the big picture look at these uh, at these uh, changes, and we have here uh, four periods: the Cold War, the post-Cold War, the Trump era, 
and the expected uh, Biden uh, grand strategy. Uh, during the Cold War, obviously, uh, it was a realist grand strategy focusing on the balance of power with, uh, with the Soviet Union. The explanation is very simple. Once you have in the international system a great power competitor, you are compelled by the system to follow a real politic logic of the balance of power, because the, that's the only possibility to survive, or at the very least to secure uh, your interest by following the logic of the balance uh, of power. When the Cold War uh, ended and the Soviet Union disintegrated in uh, December 1991, uh, the United States emerged as the hegemon, as the sole superpower in the international system, and that allowed for the emergence of liberal hegemony. The United States really could translate its uh, basic liberal beliefs into its foreign policy, uh, meaning uh, it has uh, quite a few elements, but democracy promotion, uh, uh, building and highlighting international institutions, as much as possible free trade, multilateralism, and, uh, and a globalization. Um, it, when, what, what happened with uh, President Trump? Obviously, um, it, there were some big changes that are related to Trump personality and to uh, economic and cultural grievances in the American heartland, we saw some of the violent, unfortunate manifestation of that on Wednesday in, uh, in Washington, uh, uh, DC. But in my argument is that uh, the international system also helped us to understand uh, what happened with the rise of the uh, nationalist America first grand strategy of, uh, of Trump. This strategy, put it very briefly, very simply, focus basically on the material gains of the United States in a zero in, in a zero sum game. Namely, the idea is basically that every international bargain there is winner and loser, and if uh, and so basically the uh, the quest, the aim, the goal of the uh, Trumpist uh, nationalist America First administration is always the United States will be the winner while assuming the others will be the loser and avoiding major attempts at uh, an endeavor at uh, international uh, uh, cooperation. What, what is the kind of international systemic logic behind the emergence of this uh, grand strategy? Again, we go to the two basic factors of the international system. One is question of power, and the second is the question of threats. With regard uh, to power, what happened in the last few years, uh, in, let's say the second half of the second decade of the 21st century, is a process of power transition. Uh, the United States still the most powerful actor in the international system, but other powers uh, uh, rose, most notably by far uh, China. So under this uh, kind of a change and this kind of power transition, the willingness of the American uh, public to uh, tolerate a uh, leading uh, a liberal uh, uh, international order declined quite uh, uh, drastically, in addition to the various failures and the, the huge cost in blood and treasure, or for example, of the um, uh, democracy promotion intervention in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, later uh, uh, Libya. So uh, the willingness of the public decline to tolerate this kind of liberal grand uh, strategy. Uh, the second major change, uh, actually, is that the relation between American society and the international system. Part of the, as we witnessed on Wednesday, um, American society now and American polit pol uh, politics is polarized probably in a higher degree than the civil war in the, in the 19th century. But this polarization also reflected itself with regard to the conception of what is the key threat confronting the United States. Whereas before, both during the Cold War and the post-Cold War, there was a basic agreement about the nature of the threat or the absence of threat. For example, in the 1990s, when the United States was a hegemon without a major threat, and then the rise of uh, um, Islamic terrorism uh, after 9-11. What happened in the last few years 
part of this polarization is uh, the rise of disagreement and threats. The realist people who look at the power politics uh, focus on China uh, and other liberals focus on Russia. Russia um, violating international norms, uh, uh, invading other, other countries, challenging their territorial integrity and intervening in Western democracies in order to discredit election, to discredit uh, democracy. So for liberals, Russia is the, uh, became the major threat. At the same time, populist, and Trump being a kind of representative, focus on a completely different set of uh, threats that appealed or look very frightening to uh, some parts of American society. Uh, terrorism, migration, and the supposed change in American culture, in American society, in the, and also in the demographic power of relative parts of American society because of this uh, uh, migration. Uh, so under uh, this condition of, of absence of agreement about the nature of the threat, a realist grand strategy is unlikely to take place. However, now with the incoming uh, uh, Biden administration, actually there is a fundamental basis for a new uh, grand strategy, even though this grand strategy will have two major components which are, supposed, which are not uh, easily reconcilable and that will be a difficult mission, a difficult task, a difficult challenge of the Biden administration. But we must uh, understand the two major changes that are taking place uh, in international politics. One is uh, now it's not anymore about transition. Basically now it's the, for the first time since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there is an emergence of a great power competitor because of the rise of China. Now it's very clear, it's not precisely the bipolarity of the Cold War, but it's basically two great powers confronting uh, each other in uh, different ways. And that means that on the geopolitical, supposedly the classical high politics domain, the United States must pursue a realist grand strategy focusing essentially on the balance of power with China in a different uh, ways. However, the other change that is taking place, just, okay, uh, just complete here and then we'll move to the next uh, uh, chart, please, uh, is the change in the nature of threat. And that is, in addition to geopolitical, uh, still very important uh, kind of classical great power competitor, China threat and all, all of that, there has been upgrading of transnational threat, of global threat, threats to all of humanity. Uh, one obvious one is the climate change. And the second one uh, that was clear after, <laughs> after 2020, after uh, last year, the pandemic. In addition, obviously, to nuclear proliferation, terrorism and so on, threats that threaten all of humanity. And here, liberalism has a lot to offer. So in this sense, what I expect of the Biden uh, grand strategy is kind of the delicate, uneasy integration of these two elements, the realist, real politic, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, and uh, at the same time, the upgrading of the global threat and the need to cope with them with international cooperation, obviously with the European and the other liberal uh, allies, but also, there must be cooperation with China. You cannot deal with climate change without cooperation with, uh, with China. They are the two largest uh, polluters in the world, the United States and, and China. And pandemic, we saw the effect of China and potential spread of, of pandemic. So uh, there must be cooperation with China. So how to reconcile the two? That's a very, very difficult challenge, but uh, that, that probably will be the focus of the Biden uh, grand strategy. If you can now, uh, okay. So basically uh, this two by two uh, chart, uh, this two by two table uh, summarize the argument. We have two factor which determine the combined effect of these two factors determine the nature of the grand strategy. One is, is there, is there a great power competitor to the United States? Oh, no great power competitor. And the second factor is the nature of the threat. 
is the dominant threat still the traditional national security threats involved with large scale violence in different ways or the uh, emergence of the new global transnational uh, threats. So in the Cold War, it was uh, very easy. The great power competitor uh, with a traditional uh, a national security threat. However, with the end of the Cold War, kind of the post-Cold War, especially the 1990s, uh, we have no great power competitor of the United States and the start of the emergence of the transnational threat. And that led to kind of defensive liberal uh, grand strategy focusing on globalization institution aiming to integrate a China. And what happened with this effort to integrate China is critical for understanding the future uh, Biden grand strategy as I will elaborate in a minute. But just to conclude here, post 9-11, moving to regime change, uh, imposed democracy, offensive liberalism, uh, because of the uh, back again to traditional security threat, even though non violent non-security threat, the terrorist action of uh, Al-Qaeda and 9-11. And, uh, and now coming to Biden, Biden is now will have uh, to, uh, to face, to confront these two issues. Having a great power competitor, China, and has to deal with it in a realist manner, in the real politic uh, sense, but at the same time also the upgrading of the uh, transnational global threat. If you can, thank you. Uh, it's just okay. Benny, so that's uh, just about uh, starting okay. to, to wrap up. Okay, so I'm just uh, talking about China and maybe just a few words about the Middle East. Uh, I've basically all the key foreign policy issues and especially what important here is to highlight both the changes uh, in the Biden, new Biden uh, grand strategy vis-a-vis -vis the earlier Biden as part of the liberal elite. Uh, and also obviously in comparison with, uh, with Trump. China is the key here. What happened with the earlier Biden was the idea that integration, accommodation and engagement with China will produce a new China, eventually leading both to domestic and foreign policy changes. Domestic, China will democratize and will become democratic even though it will take some time. And it, in, in foreign policy, it will pacify China and integrate it into the liberal inter, international order. But this liberal agenda didn't succeed. China is now more authoritarian than it was in earlier years, and it's now more assertive, if not more aggressive, in its foreign, economic, and technological uh, policy. The Trump response to it was kind of a cold war with, uh, with China. Biden initially will not go to this kind of uh, a confrontational uh, attitude toward China. It will be kind of a cold peace, where the initial expectation was for a warm peace. Trump moved to Cold War. Uh, Biden will be kind of a cold peace, which will be this integration of great power competition, but at the same time, the need, the, there must be some level of cooperation in order to avoid disaster and in order to avoid inadvertent escalation, especially in the South China Sea and in Taiwan, there might be inadvertent escalation and that's uh, very, uh, very dangerous. About the Middle East, uh, just to, uh, so to just conclude. Maybe Benny, maybe we'll, okay. we'll open that up in the Q&A. Okay. Okay, great. So, so really it's this, I think Benny raised this really central dilemma competition on one hand and cooperation on the other, right? And it's, it's, uh, it's irreconcilable, but that is something that Biden's going to have to reconcile because of the nature of, of the global threat. So I think that that's really thought provoking and, and we'll open up now really, we'll transition to talking about the Middle East. Uh, so th thank you, Benny, and, and we'll try to develop that in the Q&A. Uh, so now we're moving from the Biden doctrine, from the American vision that Yossi and Benny mapped up for us. I want us to come here locally to the region and I'm very happy uh, uh, to invite a uh, uh, Dr. Brandon Friedman. Uh, uh, Dr. Friedman is a director of research at the Moshe Dayan Center for the Middle East and African Studies here at Tel Aviv University. Uh, and, uh, and Brandon will speak about uh, an Obama redux, US disengagement from the Middle East, paradox and perception. So uh, Brandon, please. My thanks to you, uh, uh, Dr. Yoav Fromer and the Center for the Study of the United States uh, and the Fulbright Program for the invitation today. It's an honor and a pleasure to share the virtual stage with such a distinguished group of co-panelists and I'm happy to be here. Um, 
if you have, you said earlier that um, it's unlikely we'll see a, an Obama 2.0 too much. There's too much water under the bridge. And I agree with you, but uh, the Biden foreign policy may not repeat o o the Obama doctrine, but it may rhyme with it in important ways. And I think it's important for us to understand the continuities and changes. Um, and those continuities, by the way, also include from Obama to Trump to Biden, and they're important continuities. Um, the first, so I want to make five basic points, uh, time permitting. First, it's quite clear the Biden administration wants to militarily downsize in the Middle East and shift its focus to the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, whatever your favorite term is, for Asia. Um, that's very clear. It was outlined uh, in, in several important articles published in Foreign Affairs throughout the campaign at the end of the campaign year in 2020. Um, and I think that's what we're, we're going to see, uh, which raises the question about the fact of what the traditional U.S. partners in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Egypt, Jordan, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates see and feel and are doing in order to prepare themselves for that. And I would argue it's a process that's been going on now for a decade. It's also the second point I want to make. It's important to bear in mind there's, there's important continuity in the personnel that have already been named to the Biden administration. Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, played an important role in the Iran nuclear deal. Um, opening the back channel for negotiations in 2012. Tony Blinken, the new Secretary of State, played an important role in Obama's uh, drawing down um, U.S. combat forces from Iraq in 2010-2011. William Burns is the new head of the CIA, and he also played a very critical role in the back channel uh, nuclear negotiations with Iran. And finally, Susan Rice was recently appointed the head of domestic, the Domestic Policy Council, which I imagine will play a more outsized role than it has in the past. The third point I want to make is the Biden administration seems to be embracing a similar approach to the Obama administration in the sense that it sees force and diplomacy as mutually exclusive rather than mutually reinforcing. And I would say that point more than any other troubles traditional U.S. allies in the region. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. The fourth point I want to make is the Obama administration encouraged what became known as the responsibility doctrine. Uh, it wanted U.S. partners in the region to take more responsibility for being their own security providers. And I would argue that that's um, what we've seen in connection with that responsibility doctrine has been a disaster in places like Iraq and Syria and Yemen and Libya. And even the increasing securitization in the Horn of Africa is becoming a really big trouble zone. The fifth point, and I think it's an important one, it's more American focused than the Middle East, is that the U.S. no longer, and this is a continuity, from Obama to Trump and now to Biden. The U.S. is not interested in creating a global security architecture along the lines of the post-World War II, NATO, CENTO, CETO. Um, the U.S. views the Middle East in a very, I would say, pointillist national interest kind of way. Um, issues like terrorism, oil in Israel are paramount. And issues that historically in the 20th century have been key to the United States, like trade, development, and democracy, have been cast aside. And that's important. So there's a paradox here. The region, at least the key U.S. Part, traditional partners in the region, see the U.S. as disengaging from the Middle East and have persistently expressed that for nearly a decade now. Um, now, there's, the paradox is that the U.S. has played an outside role on the ground in military operations during the same 10 years. The U.S. played a role in leading from behind, so to speak, in deposing the Qaddafi regime in Libya. And despite, the U.S. played a leading role in putting together a 70-country coalition to defeat the Islamic State between 2014 and 2017. And the U.S. also captured and killed Osama bin Laden, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, as well as under Trump Qasem Soleimani in Iran. So there's a dissonance between the actual scope and importance of the U.S. military presence in the region and the widespread perception in the region that the U.S. is disengaging from the Middle East. And I would argue that that is the single greatest paradox in the Middle East in the past decade. The fact of the matter is that most of the traditional U.S. partners in the region see a power vacuum that's emerged in the last 10 years from Obama to Trump and now um, fear that they fear it will continue with Biden. It's very clear if you read um, if you read the articles and policy papers by key uh, figures in the incoming Biden administration that they want to minimize U.S. security commitments and restrict U.S. strategic engagements in the Middle East. This U.S. pullback, as I mentioned, was a decade in the making. The Arab Spring um, created the belief amongst uh, key 
figures in the Obama administration, the US can't control outcomes in the region. The global financial crisis triggered a debate in the United States about whether the US had endless amounts of money to spend in the Middle East. Between 2007 and 2013, the US became an oil and gas power, but that's sort of, you could, you could argue that, I would argue that that structural change has been overstated. The US still um, it feels deeply invested in protecting the, the free flow of oil, particularly to its partners in Asia. And finally, um, everyone's aware of it, and, and all of our speakers up till now have mentioned it, the fact that the U.S. is putting its emphasis on Asia. And I would say one of the, one of the big differences between the emerging rivalry between the U.S. and China and uh, the Cold War with, with the Soviet Union was that the U.S. was included in the Cold War in the strategic architecture the U.S. created um, in the 1950s, 60s, and beyond, whereas the U.S. seems entirely focused on Asia only when it comes to the rivalry with China. And I think that's important for us in the Middle East to be cognizant, cognizant of. Now, how do I know that the US um, traditional allies view the United States as disengaging, withdrawing, or retreating? Um, well, there are basically, uh, I would say, six, six key points. First, the US drew down all of its combat forces from Iraq in 2010, 2011. The US abandoned its uh, three-decade partner, Hosein Mubarak, in Egypt, um, after scarcely three weeks. Um, the US was involved in toppling Gaddafi's regime in Libya, but didn't stick around to make sure that the situation there was stabilizing. The Obama administration didn't want another Afghanistan um, as it's been put in several different memoirs of key administration figures. The Syrian red line was a big credibility issue for the region. Um, in 2013, the Obama administration said that um, the Assad regime using chemical weapons against his people in Syria was an American red line that Obama chose not to enforce. And obviously the failure to confront Assad at all during the Obama years, specifically during the military operation that defeated the Islamic State between 2014 and 2017, was a big disappointment to some key U.S. Um, partners, including first and foremost Saudi Arabia. And finally, just the way the U.S. fought the war against the Islamic State in Syria was a huge change. The U.S. Uh, embraced what was described as a by, with, and through military strategy on the ground, meaning the U.S. Um, certainly played an important leadership role, but most of the fighting was subcontracted out to key U.S. partners, first and foremost, amongst them the Syrian Defense Forces, um, the, the, the core kernel of that group being the um, Syrian Kurds. Okay. The responsibility doctrine. I just want to say a few words about this. Um, this notion that the Obama administration emphasized that U.S. partners need to take more responsibility for protecting themselves. This led to the Saudi invasion of Yemen in March 2015 to try to roll back the Houthi coup d'etat, the Iranian-backed Houthi coup d'etat. Um, we saw Turkey invade um, involve itself in three different invasions in Syria, and it's now occupying large chunks of Syrian territory, um, whether it was Operation Euphrates Shield, Olive Branch, or Operation Peace Spring. And these are US allies, by the way. One of the key factors that's taken place in the last five years in the Middle East is that it, whether it's Libya or Yemen or Syria, you see US partners on opposite sides of the war. The UAE is fighting Turkey and Libya in Syria, the Turkey is fighting the Syrian Defense Forces, which was the major U.S. partner against the Islamic State, meaning the U.S. hasn't shown any interest in taking an organizing role in these conflicts. And as a result, what you see is U.S. partners on opposite sides of major conflicts in the region. Um, okay. I want to call your attention to America, an article published by Jake Sullivan, uh, Daniel ben in uh, America's Opportunity in the Middle East, published in Foreign Affairs in May 2020. Jake Sullivan obviously is the incoming national security advisor, the youngest in nearly half a century in the United States, I think since McGeorge Bundy. Um, and so they outline very clearly what the US ambition is for the Middle East. And it, they stated very clearly that one, they wanna go back to the Iranian nuclear deal. Two, they wanna initiate uh, a strategic dialogue between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which we, through the good offices of the United Nations Security Council. Um, and they believe that that strategic dialogue will enable uh, the Saudis and the Iranians to begin to de-escalate in important theaters in the Middle East, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain. 
meaning they write a loosely connected approach would create a, the incentive structure, and here they mean relieving sanctions, um, that would connect this strategic regional dialogue to the Iranian nuclear deal. But I think the weakness of their argument, and, and by the way, it, it's an elegant argument that they make, and it's an article worth reading, is that repeatedly they say that they, uh, that as almost a parenthetical, that the US needs to maintain a credible deterrent in the region while it does this. And I would argue that that's the very crux of the issue. The region no longer believes that the US is interested in maintaining a credible deterrent. That the message that the US has broadcast over the years with, and I would even say it applies to the Trump administration as well, the Qasem Soleimani assassination being an exception, is that the US has no appetite for more wars or more conflicts or more military engagements in the Middle East. And finally, this gets me to, to an issue that probably is uh, of more interest to everyone else here, which is the issue of normalization deals, the peace deals, if you will, that uh, the Trump administration managed to broker between Israel and several Arab states in the region. I would argue that those deals in and of themselves are a signal that the US is looking to disengage from the region. That this is the US um, literally walking itself out of um, uh, major issues in the region. You know, I didn't really plan on saying anything about the Palestinian issue today. Uh, frankly, my instinct, and it's nothing more than that, is, is that the Biden administration won't have enough bandwidth in the first hundred days and won't want to risk political capital on failing with the Israeli-Palestinian issue, that if it does deal with it, it will only be later in the administration. There are too many other priorities, many of which were named here by Professor Schein and Professor Miller before, beforehand. And so what I think we're likely to see, depending on how politics shape up here, is uh, more of the same on the Palestinian issue. Ter terrific. All right. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, you know, you raised so many issues I, I had not thought about. And I think there's so many things here that, that are worth really developing in our Q&A afterwards. So, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and, and now I, I, I want to invite a, a Noah Landau uh, to, to really bring it home, I think, to literally, right, to talk about what's closest to us. And it's, it's the Israeli perspective, right? So we moved from the American to the Middle Eastern Arab. And, and now finally, I think, to the Israeli perspective. Uh, and what Israel wants, what it hopes, what it fears, maybe, you know, from the incoming administration, given the, the bad blood between uh, Obama and uh, Netanyahu four years ago, right? So, so uh, it is my pleasure to invite Noah Landau, a senior writer and editor for Haaretz newspaper. And until recently, she was also the newspaper's diplomatic correspondent. So I'm sure she has a lot of things to really offer us contemporary uh, stuff from her own experience. So uh, she will speak to us about the hopes and the fears. Is Israel waiting for Biden? And uh, Noah, please, welcome. Thanks, Yoav, and hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so my topic is titled, Is Israel Waiting for Biden? And to answer, of course, we need to define first who or what exactly Israel is in this question. Um, so let's assume for now that we're talking about the current Israeli government, or if the unexpected happens uh, in the fourth round of elections, then another right-wing government, uh, probably. Um, for sure, we all know this is a very complicated uh, relationship. Netanyahu has completely aligned himself with Trump in the past four years in a way that now makes it much more difficult than ever to restore the traditional bipartisan relationship. Uh, remember, for example, how long it took Netanyahu to even congratulate Biden and call him president-elect. It was unprecedented. Uh, on the other hand, the relationship between Israel and the U.S., of course, goes much deeper than that. And Biden and Harris are also probably uh, the best, quote unquote, uh, Democrats that Netanyahu could have uh, hoped for. Uh, even though the Democratic Party itself is definitely shifting left on Israel, uh, they uh, specifically both personally demonstrated along the years a very center uh, APAC attitude towards Israel. Um, so Netanyahu has two main options now, uh, to try the traditional my dear friend attitude uh, while avoiding direct confrontation if not urgently needed, or uh, present Biden as a rival as he did with Obama, uh, mostly for internal domestic uh, political reasons. And I think the latter is difficult. Biden is not Obama. Uh, he didn't find himself as Zionist many times in the past. He keeps talking all the time about his memorable meetings with Golda Meir. Uh, you can't really demonize him uh, too much. And there's also the question, uh, 
that what could really become a contentious debate between these two. So most will obviously say Iran. Uh, Biden was, of course, a supporter of the JCPOA, which is now loudly opposed. Uh, Biden even described the Trump administration uh, decision to pull out of the agreement as self-inflicted disaster. Uh, he said in a J Street event in September that if elected, he would be willing to revive the deal if Iran returns to, com to compliance. But on the other hand, um, not only that Biden is not Obama, this is uh, 2021, and I very much agreed with Yoav's uh, opening remarks. A lot has happened in the region, and in general, uh, we, have the, we have the Abraham Accords uh, coalition, uh, Iran's current violations, the ballistic question, even the E3 European countries are not on the same page as before on Iran. So yes, Biden and our relations uh, will defer on Iran, but does this mean we will see a full power confrontation as we saw during Obama's time? I think not necessarily. Uh, even outgoing Ambassador David Friedman just told uh, yesterday the mm -hmm. Knesset Committee on Foreign Affairs that he thinks Israel should start a quiet dialogue on the subject together with a uh, new public uh, Gulf coalition. Uh, as for uh, the other issues, uh, like, let's take the U.S. embassy move, for example. Uh, Biden has already stated that he has no intention of moving back to Tel Aviv. Uh, he did say that he would reopen the U.S. consulate to East Jerusalem, which had served the Palestinian community and was merged into the embassy uh, during Trump's time. And on the normalization agreements, Biden already praised these uh, diplomatic breakthroughs. Uh, he actually descri described the first uh, agreement with the UAE as a, a welcome, brave, and badly needed act of statesmanship. The main question will, of course, be um, regarding Saudi Arabia, uh, if it will join the agreements, uh, considering Biden's different uh, attitude towards uh, human rights violations, which was mentioned here before. And on the Palestinian uh, issue in general, uh, I liked uh, Brendan's uh, conclusion, but maybe I will elaborate a little bit. Uh, of course, Biden is a two-stater, but I don't really see him initiating anything dramatic uh, when he has such bigger issues to deal with at home, of course, like COVID-19 and the financial applications. And annexation is already off the table, thanks to the UAE. So Biden will probably be harsher on Israel, mostly regarding the settlements. Uh, they will strongly condemn any construction plans and pressure to freeze it. Uh, same thing regarding deportation of Palestinian communities in Area C. But will Biden stop the settlement project? Will it stop the occupation? None of them stopped during Obama. So I, I highly doubt it will change under Biden. Uh, on US aid to Israel, uh, some in the Democratic Party have expressed recently support for conditioning uh, future aid on commitment to some future concessions. But Biden himself said that leveraging U.S. aid would be a gigantic mistake, his quote. And uh, on BDS, Biden is a fierce opponent. Uh, he even said that it's uh, too often veers into anti-Semitism, uh, even though he did condemn Israel's decision to bar democratic lawmakers from entering the country. So uh, to conclude, uh, yes, there are obvious differences, assuming Netanyahu will win the election. Um, but the differences are manageable, and Biden has many other problems to deal with before us. Uh, if at all, I think it will be interesting to see how actually the Democrats uh, that are more engaged on Israel um, will uh, maybe uh, pressure Biden and J Street too. Uh, will be harder for them uh, to criticize him from the left after all the support he got uh, to replace Trump. So uh, there, I assume the dialogue will be quieter as well. And finally, I want to add something on a, a personal perspective of Netanyahu Biden's relations. Uh, on the contrary to what many thought about Netanyahu's relations with Trump, uh, behind the scenes, uh, the way I saw it, although Netanyahu tried very hard to create the impression of a warm, close, unshakable friendship, uh, mostly because flattery was the best way to handle a person, person like Trump, honestly. Uh, the reality was not always that simple. Uh, behind the scenes, Trump surprised Netanyahu many times with unexpected statements and requests uh, that contradicted his uh, declared policy. And many efforts were needed, overseen by ambassadors uh, David Friedman and Ron Dermer, to iron out all those wrinkles. Uh, for example, I myself heard Netanyahu said with, say with a smile that he saw no urgency in advancing Trump's peace plan. 
So I think that as far as the personal uh, chemistry, Netanyahu actually probably prefers a stable and expected leader as Biden. Thank you. Well, that's very surprising, but very edifying. So, so thank you very much, Noah. And, and for all, I want to I uh, thank everyone here for just uh, saying so many smart and interesting and uh, original ideas, which I, I don't think we've heard in most of the, of the, of the discourses outside here. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And I'm also thankful that we more or less, you met the time requirements, which are rare, but that leaves us now with, with a good 15, 20 minutes to have a conversation uh, and to take questions. And we've got quite a few questions here. So let me, let me I, I wanna raise the first question, which quite a few people were, were also on the chat and also on our email here in, in the center's email. And it has to do with the Palestinians, right? Uh, and, and it's the question of does Biden, right? So may, maybe not in the next, two years, all right? So let's say theoretically he, they, they, they get through COVID and somehow and also they get through, uh, a, a begin, begin to stabilize the economy. Uh, do we foresee, or, and this is to, for, for everyone on the panel, uh, do you foresee a situation that when Biden engages the Palestinian issue, does he go back using the Obama playbook, right? Or did the Abraham Accords change that forever? Or, I mean, in that sense, did Trump change it forever by saying that we don't have to go back to that model of, of land for peace and, and direct uh, negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians? We can maybe do it regionally through the Saudis, through the UAE. And, you know, is there maybe a new alternative model for, for this Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, discourse? And, uh, and this is for everyone. Uh, so uh, if uh, anyone, uh, no, Yossi, do, do you, do you want to begin? I, I think, first of all, thank you so much for uh, all these very uh, astute comments. I think that we, we have a, a, a paradigm shift, I think, in, in Washington um, that indeed see that the Palestinian issue is not the most acute issue in the Middle East. This has been, you know, if you if you look at uh, uh, Aaron Miller and Dennis Ross and others have pointed out, and these are people, kind of an Obama Clinton people, uh, who saw that we have moved beyond that. This is also a matter of a zeitgeist. Uh, the the uh, Trump administration uh, used the, the issue of the Palestinian uh, statehood is an important one, uh, but but most importantly is to build a coalition in the Middle East. And I think this will be also, I presume, a Biden administration position, but it will try also to build this coalition in a different fashion that perhaps will not overlook the Palestinian issue, but will bring the Palestinians to the fore. But they will have to find also the leadership issue. And this is something which you can see from all the uh, exchanges that you see um, in, in Washington, that they are not certain about Mahmoud Abbas, whether he will have to be uh, 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 it will be a post Mahmoud Abbas issue, and therefore they will have to wait. So I agree that we are in a, in a different posture here, a posture that basically said that the Palestinian issue is not the core issue for Middle East conflict, rather than there are other possibilities. And secondly, the very issue of the Obama administration, if you remember, the key factor in the Obama administration from the beginning was the daylight, the very essence to put the daylight between us and Israel because this causes rumbling in the Middle East. Of course, the Trump administration was not on the issue of the daylight, but rather <clears throat> not only with proximity, but basically merging America and Israel and said, there is no daylight, we are together in this. Perhaps there'll be a little bit more distance, but in a different fashion, not a hostile distance, but a different distance. So in my opinion, the Biden administration will not run into bringing the Palestinian issue to the fore in this full-fledged sort of like uh, uh, what we saw uh, with the Obama administration, but will basically say, let's widen this circle of, of arrangements. Um, of course, they have the issue of Polisario and Morocco. There, there's some really big critical issue, the recognition of sovereignty of Morocco, which is kind of like a sticking point. And I've seen some writings about it, but I leave this aside. Uh, I think that this is the, this will be the, the temperament here, not to push back, but rather to see how can we basically through this enlarging of peace deals in the Middle East and arrangements to bring back the Palestinian issue to the, uh, to the system, not with an aggressive fashion, but rather gingerly and, 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 and perhaps awaiting, or the pretense will be awaiting for the new leadership to emerge among the Palestinians. 
Uh, uh, Benny, did you want to address the Palestinian yeah, issue? Yeah, if I may, thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, definitely Biden is a two-state uh, uh, ideologically in declination. However, um, I think if we put it in a larger, uh, the larger picture is that the Middle East is declining importance in American grand strategy for at least three reasons. One is uh, what we all uh, try to emphasize is to the so-called pivot to Asia, the rise of China, that will be the overwhelming issue. And even Europe will decline in importance, let alone the Middle East. The second is the United States became energy independent in the last few years. So it's not as much dependent on Middle East. It's still important for the global um, economy and so on, the Middle East oil, but less so for the United States. So that, and the third is this, uh, what Trump has said many times, but it reflects something fundamental about American society. And that's the endless wars in the Middle East. American politics, American society broadly defined became disenchanted from the Middle East because of the bad experience of the last uh, two decades or so. And, and, and that would lead to declining focus on the Middle East uh, more broadly. Trump had, had his own, uh, you know, Sheldon Edison, who unfortunately passed away today. It was one reason why he's so focused on the Middle East and uh, the second evangelist. And these two factors uh, will be missing uh, for uh, Biden. But the, but the other key question is, what kind of grand strategy you apply to the Middle East? Actually, there are two possibilities. One is, there are two, let's say, two competing camps in the Middle East. You side with one of them against the other. That was the Trump grand strategy. Siding with the Arab uh, conservatives, Gulf, uh, whatever, states, and Israel against, against Iran. The other one is what Obama tried to do, uh, maybe unsuccessfully, is that to try to, uh, and that's part of the logic of the pivot to Asia, is to try to uh, offshore balancing, namely, to uh, create a balance of power in the Middle East, and that would allow the United States comfortably enough to depart from the Middle East because there is a kind of a balance of power in the Middle East, and that involved this nuclear deal with Iran. That was the overall strategic logic behind the, in addition to obviously uh, a, a non-proliferation. Uh, and I think Biden is more inclined uh, to the second uh, uh, grand strategy, uh, uh, in try to create uh, some balance, maybe it wouldn't be as committed to Obama because of the overwhelming agenda they will have to confront domestically and with China and all this issue. But that will be kind of a shift from standing with one coalition against the other to try to be more a uh, kind of uh, arbiter that allow you uh, to gradually disengage from, Middle, from the Middle East at least militarily, which is the overall goal of American grand strategy for the, uh, for the future. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Brandon, do, do you wanna uh, address the Palestinian issue? Yeah, I just wanted to say two things about it. The, the first is, um, first of all, I, I wanna be clear that the normalization agreements are an unprecedented sea change in Israel's relationship with the Arab world and should be viewed as a historical change and shouldn't be um, minimized or underestimated. But on the other hand, the, the Trump plan for peace between Israel and the Palestinians was an outside-in plan. And if you judge it based on being an outside-in plan designed to produce some kind of engagement between Israel and the Palestinians where the Arab states pressure the Palestinians and the United States press, pressures Israel, and I, I think that was the Trump plan very early on, then it was a failure. Um, in terms of what the Trump administration was trying to achieve. And I, I, so Yav, I understood your question is asking, is the outside in plan viable in the future? And will Biden pursue it? And um, I don't know the answer to either of those questions, but I'll say this with respect to Israel's peace treaties. Israel made peace with Egypt in March, 1979, despite the fact that the US wanted more of a re broader regional peace. Um, Anwar Sadat went to Jerusalem because he was fed up with the Carter administration and wanted a direct channel to Israel. Um, the, the peace made between in the Oslo Accords in 1993 was a, a result of a direct engagement between Israelis and Palestinians. The peace with Jordan in 94 was direct engagement between the parties trying to make peace. Um, so if we look at the historical record, it would suggest that um, for, for there to be progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front, it will need to come from the inside out. At least that's, 
but again, history doesn't always repeat itself, and, uh, but that's just my take. But, but I, I do want to just emphasize, because what Brandon said is a really important historical lesson here, that maybe the United States, uh, you know, its efforts are counterproductive. It's almost as if sometimes the United States gets in the way. And we just think about the, the historical successes of Sadat uh, and also Oslo to a certain extent, even though Clinton, they, they come in pretty late in the game, but they do come in eventually. But maybe then if, if peace, uh, as Brandon, I think, suggests indirectly, if, if it's... Uh, inside outside, as he said it, right? And not kind of enforced from, from an American perspective. Maybe it has a better chance of actually than succeeding. Uh, would I be correct in, in saying that? I'll let other, others comment, but that's, yeah. that's, my, that's my sense for, from the historical trajectory of our um, yeah, that's, that's really, record. really interesting. Yeah. May, may I comment on uh, that point? Uh, uh, yeah, wait, let me just, I just want to get Noah's point about the Palestinian issue. Hey, Noah, please. Sure, I mean, I think I, uh, I spoke about the Palestinian issue, but um, I really agree with uh, Yossi on this point that there will be um, a very uh, specific effort on how to bring in the Palestinians into the Abraham Accords. Uh, I think that more than the question of uh, plan of the century, uh, this specific issue would be much more urgent uh, regarding Iran. So um, even now, I mean, we see that that th this is the, the main conversation on the Palestinian issue vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States is how to bring in uh, the Palestinians uh, to this effort of the Abraham Accords. So I, I think this this will probably be uh, the first concern. And regarding um, regarding the Trump plan, um, I'm not sure if I really see this as an outside inside uh, question because um, Trump's plan was um, actually representing some very much inside voices uh, within Israel. It reflected. Uh, the opinion of certain circles in the right wing, which helped write uh, the plan, uh, some of them. So in many aspects, this, th this was a, uh, a plan that uh, reflected uh, one side within Israel, not necessarily from the outside. So, so well, if I, I, just, if I, I say one word, I mean, it, and this relates to many of the things, you know, it's, it's right now, it seems to do the, 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 the war, Progressive impulses in Washington will be tamed in the Biden administration. But remember, you know, like, uh, what's his name? Um, Peter Beinart's sort of essay that he wrote, we don't want any more leadership. The very essence of leadership, global leadership for America should be, should be erased even from the language. So there will be some tendencies about it vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East. And I think it relates to what Brandon said. And of course, what Benny said with the decline of the issue of oil, et cetera. But, um, you know, we, we know also that the Palestinian issue itself is not, and I think that relates to Brandon's thesis, it not, is not awaiting for Trump involvement, is not awaiting for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for Biden's involvement. It basically creates itself. And when it will come back to the fore, for a variety of reasons, and it in, in, in may or may not, I think then it will be addressed usually, and it's not gonna be addressed as a way of a, of a plan. The, 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 the Trump plan is still a very, uh, you know, is, is a plan that some have recommended to start to pursue, but it will be only when we'll have difficulties on the ground. And difficulties of the ground will be perhaps dictating American foreign policy more than anything else. I don't think they want to be engaged. Uh, Benny, what, what did you want to add, yeah. please? Yeah, with regard to what Brandon said about the US role in all the peace agreement with Egypt, Jordan, uh, and, and so on. I think the U.S. role was critical, even though uh, Sadat went to uh, Jerusalem, for example, against the initial inclination of President Carter, his aim basically was uh, to get economic aid from the United States. Right. Similarly about Jordan, for Israel, always it was the security umbrella of, of the United States. And also the, the recent uh, Abraham Accords were basically mediated by the United States. So I think the U.S. role for peacemaking in the Middle East is uh, critical. And the question is, if indeed the United States moves away from the Middle East because of this Asia Pacific dominance of American grand strategy, what would it mean for, for uh, peace in the region? Indeed, the other, the other angle of this peace is the common threat. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. is because of Iran and partly because of Turkey. That is, that is the record, that is the background for the Abraham Accord. But still, you need a mediator. 
a honest mediator, and the United States played this role in all this uh, peace agreement. And the absence of American mediation, you wouldn't have any uh, peace agreement uh, right. in the Middle East, I, right. I think. Right, no, and, 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 and I, I think all of us would agree with that point, certainly. Uh, uh, I want to raise a question of Iran. Obviously, a lot of people here, you know, they raise these questions on, on the chat and they're concerned about that. And I want to kind of think ahead. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to evaluate the Trump administration at, in general, but certainly it's foreign policy today, you know, objectively, given everything that's happening. And yet, uh, when we think about Iran and how the Biden doctrine and how the new Biden administration is going to to treat and engage Iran, uh, is it possible, and you know, this is again, this is for, for all the panel members, uh, is it possible that because of the Trump policy, right, kind of the, the, the quite bellicose policy, certainly the assassination of Soleimani and, and you know, opting out of the, of the nuclear deal, is it possible that this actually improves America's uh, place at, at the bargaining table and allows Biden to now come back sit with the Ayatollahs, right, and get a better deal? I mean, uh, and I, I think that that is something that, that uh, we must take for, you know, to try to consider. Uh, and this is for, uh, I know, anyone who wants to begin. I, th I, think, I think that the issue of Iran, uh, you know, these are not good times to give credit to the Trump administration. You know, everybody's- ne Nevertheless, right. Everybody's leery about saying anything good about the yeah, Trump yeah, administration, yeah. but certainly, the Trump administration isolated Iran. It isolated Iran completely, and it, it caused Iran's decline also in stature in Europe, everywhere in the world. And it harmed Iran very, very radically. And of course, um, um, it created the kind of a, a different uh, discussion about Iran and nuclear. And, by, and, and at the same time, the issue of, of the nuclear weapon did not was not solved. Um, you cannot go back to the old days when the Americans, or you can, but it will be a complete mistake. Remember that the, the Iran deal, the nuclear deal, was done also on the heels of the American defining the Iranians as a stabilizing force in the Middle East in light of the, uh, the, the, the Islamic State and what happened in Syria. So they really had in mind Iran as a stabilizing force, a state that they can work with. And that was kind of a compounded with the, with the, with the, with the uh, nuclear deal. Um, it is clear in Washington, and, and, and Biden will not be able to act differently, that Iran is not a stabilizing force in, in the Middle East at this stage. And especially if we take Benny's notion of American disengagement, we don't want to bring it back to play kind of like a role in this manner. So um, they will have to find to chart a different manner, to chart a different deal, but without bringing the idea of Iran as a stabilizing force in the Middle East. I don't know how they do it, Maybe others have some ideas. I agree with uh, Yossi, but but still, I think if if we look at the uranium enrichment uh, status of Iran now, the, it's much more dangerous stage than it was uh, before Trump uh, came into power. Yeah. About the formation of the country Iranian uh, coalition, I mean that that basically reflects the national security interest of the Gulf states and Israel that are confronting common threat. And that uh, kind of produced this uh, uh, counter, uh, counter alliance. By the way, the Iranian penetration into the Arab world and all that happened in you know, Syria before in Lebanon is basically partly because of Israel uh, military intervention in Lebanon, the American intervention in Iraq, and then the Arab Spring. All of that gave opportunities to Iran to take advantage of the, uh, the transborder Shia uh, ties in order to penetrate uh, to the to the Middle East, and that, that's kind of a combination of hard power, soft power, and advantage of Iran. On the other end, the United States helped to form this uh, countervailing coalition of the Gulf and 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 Israel. I think uh, Biden will try to uh, to go back to the agreement together with the Europeans, as as Yossi said. And now the alliance, the liberal alliance, especially with the European, will become a, a very prominent uh, element, also vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, in, in American grand strategy. So in this sense, uh, uh, Biden is compelled to try together with the European, maybe to do some uh, revision in the, in the nuclear, that would be the aim, definitely, but it will be difficult. But at the very least to return to the negotiating table, uh, completely different from Trump in this respect, and to try to reach a new agreement. If it will succeed or not, that's a big challenge. 
but together with the European, definitely that, that will be the, uh, the focus and it will help the trans, uh, transatlantic relation, as you pointed out, to, uh, re to re invigorate the transatlantic relation with the European allies. Uh, Brandon, uh, uh, no, do you guys want to uh, take a shot at this? The time, the time issue is really important here. Um, you know, Iran, a, a lot of what you've seen in the news in the last few days is because they really want urgently to get back to the deal uh, in a way that's favorable to them. They, they, want, uh, they want these issues ironed out before their presidential election in June. Um, they, they've gone from $75 million, billion dollars of cash reserves in, at the beginning of 2020 to uh, somewhere around $13 billion right now. And so th they're struggling e economically in a, in a very serious way. And so I think they're going to try to put uh, pressure on Biden to deal with these issues now. I just want to note um, the daughter of Ali Akbar uh, Rafsanjani, the president of Iran from 1989 until 1997, uh, or I'm sorry, 96, um, basically one of the founders of the Islamic Republic, his daughter went on Iranian television two and a half days ago uh, and basically suggested that if she were an American, she wouldn't vote for Trump, but she wished Trump won a second term because Trump, Trump's pressure was having an effect on Iranian elites. And she's sort of a reformer. She's a former member of parliament. Um, you know, what she was saying is that the uh, Iranian elites look at uh, Biden as a bit of a pushover. And I think that that's important to register, even if it's wrong or right. Um, but it's certainly a perception in certain quarters in Iran and will influence this issue. And Noah, would you like to address this? Yeah, I agree with Benny that um, although you can say the US has isolated Iran, uh, from the point of view of the actual nuclear threat, I think currently uh, the threat is actually uh, bigger than it was. Uh, one could claim. So that's on that. And regarding um, negotiations on a, on a better deal, um, we're actually at the same point where we were if uh, Trump uh, would have been reelected. Because Trump himself said many times that, you know, the next step is negotiating again. Even Netanyahu said that um, from, uh, he's, it's not that he's against negotiations, he's just want a he wants a different outcome. So um, in either way, we would have you know, seen these negotiations uh, taking place. And now question is, uh, will we go back to the same deal or have, um, uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I find it difficult from the uh, Biden administration's point of view to actually um, change the deal itself. But what Europeans are talking about now is uh, adding uh, other sub agreements uh, mm -hmm. that will deal more with the ballistic issue and right, so on. Right. Uh, so that's probably more the direction. Right. So broadening the deal, not necessarily changing it in terms of the uranium enrichment and, and those specifics. Uh, all right. One, one, one final question that, that, that I want to ask, uh, and this is going to be the this is going to be the surprising, the provocative question that I have to conclude with this question for everyone, and maybe just uh, if everyone can can answer briefly what you think about this. Uh, is it possible, given the, the broader trends of the Trump administration, but what we saw last week especially, and we're still, I think, we're, we're, we're processing that trauma. I know, I know I am at least, right, of what we saw happening to the Capitol on Wednesday. Is it possible that Israel, from Israel's perspective, needs to rethink its strategic priorities now, I'm not saying jettison, forget about America. Obviously, that's not the case. It's not feasible. However, is it possible that given a potential sense of American decline, at least in the, in the coming future, because of its inability to deal with COVID, and unfortunately, it has proven that, uh, is it possible that given this, this now that America is going to have to recuperate, right, and kind of this, this period of convalescence from the fever, of COVID, of the economy, of, of just the, you know, the, the chaos and the polarization that Israel, in terms of Israeli foreign policy, might do best to try to think of alternatives, might look eastwards. Uh, I, I don't know, improving its relationship with China even more, rethinking its st strategy uh, globally. Uh, I, I know, and I'm raising this as a question because I myself am trying to, to deal with this for quite a while. Uh, and, and anyone here, I know, Yossi, would you, would you want to address that briefly? Look, I think Israel has moved in the last few years, perhaps quietly, to build more alliances. The rhetoric is still, of course, that America is our most important strategic 
ally, and this is of course the case. Um, but Israel has moved to create new alliances in Asia in particular, with, with China, with India. And also now we see in the region. It is not to say that Israel can do without America, and we always have to be careful about that. But certainly what you suggested, the idea of the decline of America is being discussed in, this, in our country. And we have to see what are the alternatives. We do not seek alternatives in the same manner that we had America as our ally. And we still want to accentuate the language that America and its creed is part of who we are. We don't want to erase that also because the Democratic Party has not suggested as many voices that are saying we want to get away from Israel. So we will have to move gingerly, both as part of the strategic alliance with the United States, especially on issues that we have not discussed here with Turkey, and of course, Iran is a major issue, but also to continue and enlarge the circle of uh, strategic alliances, which are right now mostly on the economic level, but are also on different, different levels with other big countries in, in Asia and of course in the region. So I think this is where we are. And I think it does not, it's not only uh, the Israeli case, it's for other Arab case, our other Arab states and others. They understand that America has to deal with itself and they have to be careful. Let alone, of course, our relation with Russia. We're not talking here in the Cold War era when America was our ally and Russia was the, our nemesis. So this is something that is evolving and it's not new in the region, but certainly the language will be us and America still very important uh, uh, ally. I see here, I just point, I saw here my friend Avi Bensvi from, from Haifa who has written about this alliance for so many years. Uh, certainly, you know, we don't, we just, Poo poo it is something that doesn't exist anymore. Thank you, Yossi. Uh, Benny, would you want to? Uh, yeah, final I, think, I think we have here uh, two logics. Uh, one is the logic of the balance of power, and the, the second one is the logic of the special relation. The logic of the balance of power compels Israel, obviously, to look for alternatives, to look at the changing balance of power in the world, the China, India, and so on, the, you know, Asia becoming the center of power, maybe potentially. Uh, in the next uh, decades or so. So in this sense, you kind of look at the, you know, uh, the changing uh, power distribution and you try to align yourself with the rising powers and uh, at least the diversify your alliances. However, still there is a fundamental difference between the United States and all the other uh, rising powers. The relation with the United States are special. Uh, uh, well, the other, the other relation will be uh, more uh, transcendental, will, will be more based and kind of logic which might be changing based on changing in economy, military, and, and, and so on. So they wouldn't be kind of providing the security umbrella and the kind of larger umbrella that, the, that only the United States sure. can provide to Israel. About the US decline, yes, the US confronts many problems and definitely last week show some of the weaknesses, the pandemic show uh, many others. The polarization of American society is terrible and definitely it will in the handicap its ability to, you know, for global leadership and so on. But still, the United States has also unique sources of power. Just to mention one key difference between the United States and the other powers is a demographic one. All the other powers in the world are going to confront in the next few years major demographic problems. The Europeans, obviously, Russia and yeah. China are going to decline because they don't have enough children. Uh, but in uh, Japan, let alone Japan, the United States in this sense, it's not as good as Israel in this sense, but uh, the United States is in a much better position than all the other powers in the world. In addition to the other technological, scientific, ad great advantages of the United States, we shouldn't uh, expect American decline in the, in the near future, and the other powers are confronting major problems. Right. But all other things being equal, definitely Israel has to uh, deepen its relations with the, especially the rising Asian powers. It's very important, but that will be transcendental. And that will not serve as a substitute for the special right. relation with the United States. Right, thanks. Uh, Brandon, do, do, do you want to address that in any way? I, I want to do it in a, in a backwards way. Um, I think that part of the incentive for the United Arab Emirates to enter into the normalization accord with Israel is they were eager to have Israel's high tech, in part because that high tech, I imagine, won't just stay in the UAE, it will find its way to other markets, um, something that maybe we haven't fully considered. 
Um, and so I think that part of the UAE's changing strategy, if you look at the UAE's foreign policy, they're anti-US in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya. And so they make a, a nice deal with Israel that keeps the Americans happy. And at the same time, all of their other policies are essentially against American interests. Um, and I think what that shows is there's a trend in the region and it's not just the UAE, Egypt, you could argue is also doing a, for, a, a kind of a form of this balancing between the US and, and China and Russia. Um, I think for Israel, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, we, we get nearly $4 billion of military aid from the US, the strategic relationship is bedrock. Um, so while we have economic relations with China and other states that are important, I think uh, for the US, at least in the short term, uh, for the Israel in the short term, the relationship with the US, I think I agree with Benny, will, will remain special. Um, uh, Noah, do you want any final thoughts? Yes, um, declining, or, declining or not, uh, there is no alternative to the relations uh, between Israel and the US. Of course, Israel is trying to improve its relations uh, with India, China, Russia, etc. But these relations are much more difficult than with the US on key issues such as Iran and the Palestinians. And uh, the EU, which is uh, our biggest trade partner, is no replacement on the geopolitical aspect. And uh, another point is that many countries actually form their relations with Israel with an eye on Washington. Uh, they see Israel as kind of a backdoor, uh, you know, whether it's true or not, uh, to Washington. So uh, the U.S. has has even a role in, in these kinds of relationships, for example, in Eastern Europe. Um, and I also think we need to, uh, of course, mention a U.S. Jewry. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, the fact that the biggest Jewish community is in the U.S. Uh, is also uh, key to this issue. Um, and I actually think that, uh, again, declining or not, Israel will have to actually invest much more energy uh, trying to uh, recruit uh, Democrats and um, uh, kind of uh, fix the rift with uh, the democratic Jewish community. If I may, one word, not to be the last, but just to say, I think this will, will be a critical, interesting issue, what Noah just said. The American Jewry, which was engaged in Israel foreign policy right now, from Friedman to, uh, to Greenblatt to, to Trump uh, son-in-law, etc., is changing as we speak. The uh, Secretary of State, um, the uh, even even the uh, the new uh, the new uh, chairman of the, of the Senate. These are different Jews who are coming to the fore with a different message. The message is it's not this kind of like intimate relation with Israel, but rather a different a different kind of a climate with American Jewry. And the Biden administration will signal a different rise in the liberal stream of American Jewry as opposed to the uh, I would say to the uh, side, uh, the, the, the sidelining of the, of the liberals during the uh, uh, Netanyahu Trump administration, bringing to the fore the different voices. And this will be kind of like a new, a, a new balancing act that Israel will have to deal with. And we see it already in the rhetoric, and we, this will be also a huge challenge for Netanyahu, assuming that he's staying in power, and I uh, would like to assume that he's not. All right, so, uh, so, so first of all, I wanna thank everyone, right? I wanna thank the panelists for a wonderful and thought-provoking panel. I wanna thank the audience. I, I, I wanna end on an optimistic note, right? And, and we mentioned this point of American decline. I'm a historian of the United States and American decline is as old as the Republic. And almost every period in America has seen itself in decline. And I wanna emphasize that. And I say that because even though America is entering a, a period of convalescence, and it is, and it's sick, but it, history has proven that it has always kind of bounced back and healed and healed itself. Uh, and, and if I could be a bit cliche, even it, it has always come back stronger. So in that sense, I think there is much hope here and we shouldn't be uh, you know, too depressed about everything going on. And that's it, I'll conclude with that. Again, I wanna thank everyone here. Thank you for your time, it's appreciated. This will go up on, on our uh, social media, on our YouTube, on our website. Uh, so please check it out and within a few days, it'll be up on the YouTube and you can view it in its entirety. And again, uh, stay safe and take care everyone. And I wish everyone a good evening.